cares about personal life matter? Well, not um, this word. Okay. Can I have the... Sure. Well, she so just wants the pointer, that's all. Not? Yeah. Okay. So we've listened today during the opening session, uh, Leonor Bleza talking about personalized medicine. That's, I'm going to approach this area, but in a different way. I'll, I want to talk about from drugs by accident to drugs for the masses to personalized medicine. How did we do this path? So the problem we are facing today is the way we discover drugs and develop them is not helping in, put, in putting personalized therapeutics in the market today. Let me tell you about my first contact with personalized things. I was in primary school um, and I was trying to cut a drawing with a scissor and I couldn't make it straight. It was always, always curvy. And I was looking at the side at Joanna's drawing, and it was perfect. What the hell was wrong with me? On my fifth grade, I had a teacher that told me, oh, Daniela, I have the scissors, which is for left-handed people. And uh, no one is left-handed at my place, but it could make good use for you. And I said, the scissors for left-handed people? Who is left-handed in this room? This is a minority, and personalized therapeutics achieve, are achieved to, for very small populations, like scissors for left-handed people are, are developed for left-handed people. Let me tell you about the second uh, experience I had with personalized. Well, when I was having um, and troubles with my left hand too. When I was having my piano lesson, the professor just told me I had some basics on music. I was like five, four or five, and I, I don't recall. And the, 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 the professor just told me, put your le right thumb on C, and then I start to play the music. Well, when she had the first meeting with my mom, she said, oh, she's really dedicated. But after a month, I was introducing my left hand to the piano. And then she said, oh my god. It's not that I'm a group, uh, great piano pianist, by the way. But she just saw that she introduced it in the wrong way. I needed first with the scissors, I needed the, I needed the personalized product to help me in cutting my drawing. And on the second example, what I needed it was a, a personalized process that helped me um, learning. So that's the basic. Let me bridge these two examples to my presentation in four tracks. In the first example, um, what I'll talk about is that we are developing personalized products. They are up there. They are being developed. We have this center doing an effort to develop those. But on the other hand, we are not developing processes that help this product to get to the market. We are not developing personalized processes. Let me start by telling you which I think are the key, three key features that could help us. So we need a novelty process, a personalized process that helps developing these. We need it sustainable because the current expenditures in healthcare are increasing and we don't want products that increase it more. We want to sustain this, this continue. We, we want to plateau or um, decreasing the costs of the current therapies being developed. And the third one, we want social benefit to be our main focus while developing drugs, not regulation, not pharmaceutical companies, not physicians. It's all about social benefit. It's all about the patient. It should be. So with this in mind, let me walk you through a couple of examples that lead us first to the development of a regulatory process 
and then to tell you how this regulatory process is blocking these personalized therapeutics to reach the market. So let's start by random discovery and drugs by accident. The first, the first um, treatment, slightly effective treatment for syphilis was actually mercury. Mercury, as you might know, it's poisonous. But on the other hand, it's, it was slightly effective until the middle of the 18th century. So whenever you have to balance safety versus efficacy, if you have nothing else, so let's do it, let's go for it. This is an example of an heavy metal. Nostrums, an, a good example of nostrums are snake oil, also known as, in Portuguese, banha da cobra. This well-known name only means that, but they were effective when they were first developed. The first um, snake oils had really Chinese water snake with a uh, acid that made them cure uh, joint pain. The second generation didn't have any Chinese snake, snake on it. What it had was oil from American snakes. And it didn't work any well. And the third example, sorry, the third example, the third generation of snake oil, it's not ex exactly what we know today. It's Banga de Cobra. It doesn't have any snake oil on it. It's only known by their non-efficient um, therapy as being a non-efficient therapy. My third examples are opioids. Opioids as morphine and heroin were widely developed and widely accepted by the patients to, co to cure something as coughing. Actually, Bayer has this funny advertisement today that at the time was at the, at the beginning of the 19th century was real. They had in the same advertising, uh, we, are we are distributing among, within the US samples of first, aspirin to your doctor, and second, heroin. And they finished by saying, order, order it from your jobber. So this is incredible. You can see actually how drugs as heroin were, cur were available to any person that could get them, but only from the jobber. So my point here is that in the first case, you have a different balance between safety and efficacy. On the second example, you have snake oil that really became buying at the cobra. And on the third example, you have a drug that is highly addictive, but it was used very regularly but before the, the regulatory process came over. So with the beginning of this, of, with the beginning of regulation came with the development of drugs for the masses. Let me tell you about two uh, disasters that completely changed um, drug regulation. And why is it that so that today we have a very stringent process? Elixir sulfamylamide was developed um, was developed by a pharmaceutical company, but it d was derived from a dye because back in those days, pharmaceutical companies would act, operate at the same time in the chemical sector. When they found that this had a therapeutic effect, all the pharmaceutical and chemical companies ran into this and to develop this product. So at the end, we have 5,000 different sulfanilamides and they might work, and they started test, testing those in, in mice. And the results were that we have now a few drugs, a few sulfonyl, sulfonyl, well, sorry, sulfonylamides that help treating heart problems and hypertension. But the problem was afterwards. A company just decided to add diethylene glycol to the sulfonylamide so that it was easier for kids to take it instead of a oral pill to take it as a, uh, to drinking. The problem is that dieth diethylene gl glycol is used as antifreeze for heart. So without knowing, they end up killing more than 100 um, kids. 
And this led to the enactment of the 1936 Act that where the regulatory agency in the US required that companies needed to prove safety in order for the, the, the drug to be approved. The second, the second example, it's well known, thalidomide disaster. This drug was, was developed and approved as a pill for um, sleeping problems, but it also helped wi pregnant women avoiding a morning sickness. So they start taking it at the end and without knowing and could have known at the time, they end up, we have 12,000 newborns with very severe deformities. And by then, what they did is that the regulators enacted, sorry, the Congress, the US Congress enacted another amendment so that not only safety should be guaranteed, but also efficiency. So we end up with a process for clinical approval that requires three phases of approval that need to guarantee safety and efficacy that takes eight years at least to be developed and it costs around $1 billion per molecule. So we can see as large as these numbers can go and we can actually see that there is not a long-term effect that we can sustain. We have to change it now because at the, at the process that these costs are evolving, we have no public money that could help and also corporate money that could withstand the development process. So let me talk about Blockbuster. Blockbuster is essentially a way that pharmaceutical companies found to support this business, highly expensive business development. Blockbuster means it's jargon, pharmaceutical jargon for a, a, a drug that has revenues higher than $1 billion mark. These are well-known examples. Avacyn is actually, uh, is expected to be the leading drug in, in sales in 2014. And the two main drugs last year, 2010, generated around $20 billion, the leading selling drug. And they're expiring, their patents are expiring this year or next, which means that generics can ge get in and the pharmaceutical uh, revenues will go down. So at this point, the pharmaceutical companies, the big pharmaceutical companies have a dual challenge. On one hand, they have this highly costly process and their blockbusters are expiring and where how much money, it doesn't matter how much money they invest in R&D because it has increased during time, the number of new blockbusters is not increasing. So what we need today, it's a new solution that changes this way of developing and discovering most developing drugs that makes it less costly. So we, we are reaching, we need to reach this personalized medicine thing that Dr. Leonor Beleza was talking about. This is a new era of medical treatment that can change the life of many left-handed people, for example. It's not left-handed the disease, but the parallelism I did in the beginning is that left-handed needed the scissors for left-handed. Well, we have more than 5,000 um, rare diseases in Europe that do not have a solution only a few have a solution today. O for only a few, we are developing therapeutics that really make the difference. And this affects more than 6% of the population. So it's a very significant size of the population. What we want to do is target this small, um, the small populations with these therapeutics. A few incentives have been developed. So pharmaceutical companies and other biotechnology companies develop this, these orphan drugs like 10, 10 years of market exclusivity, factors um, support, and also uh, to support the clinical development. However, this is not enough because we are creating incentives where we are maintaining the same process of development and we are not giving it a solution or a new way, a more flexible way to adapt the process to these new therapies. 
let me talk to you about two single examples of fish engineering. Fish engineering is whenever you have cells from a patient, you culture them on a matrix, and then you have in vitro, in this case, create a, a blood vessel for your cell. So this is taken from the patient and applied to the same patient, a blood vessel built in, in, in the lab. This are currently, currently being tested in clinical trials. I visit the company, they have a few, it's funny to see blood vessels be being developed in a company, but what we can see is that there is a high unmet clinical need for these, and though they are being developed, the process of getting those to the market is so expensive because of the requirement requirement we have developed for each phase that is impossible to sustain this growth. Another example is a bladder. This is a bladder being developed in the lab. And it's actually being planted also in clinical trials for patients. So this is my key point. We need to work with process. We need to make it effective. And we, make it make, we need to make it more flexible and adapted to um, this new challenge of personalized medicine. So coming back to the beginning, we need innovative, sustainable, and mainly solutions that look at social benefit. Because healthcare is about people, we all have a role to play in this question, in this challenge, because we are all regulators, physicians, researchers, patients, and we all invest in healthcare through our government. So we have a, pl a role to play, a very important one. Be active and embrace it.